you to my day. So first, uh, let me start by thanking Bea for doing such a fantastic uh, job. It's been, I'm, 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 I'd like to consider myself her good friend, and I can tell you she's been working really, really, really hard at this. So can we just, just do a clap? <laughs> and um, also, I, I apologize for having missed a bunch of the talks. I generally don't get sick, and uh, Last time I had to take antibiotics, I was in college with a strep throat, so this is a, uh, but I guess it's really not a good idea to go to Japan, come back and go to France with a cold, weird things could happen to your system, but thank goodness we can, the one thing we can actually cure in medicine is a bacterial infection, so <laughs> anyway. So thank you for uh, inviting me to, <clears throat> uh, to, to actually present, and, and hopefully uh, for the next flux, which will be in sunny California, we will have a few more animal talks, uh, because um, I think it's a field that's really rapidly growing, and uh, hopefully I can convince you that it's a field that's absolutely necessary uh, for, for us, all of us. So why adolescence for me? I am not someone who started researching adolescence. My main interest has been on animal models of psychiatric disorders, and we've been really interested in how different brain systems, cortical, limbic, uh, uh, and midbrain systems interact uh, in uh, during conditions of high cognitive load or, or pathways that are actually relevant to psychiatric illnesses. So adolescent vulnerabilities that you have been thinking about are of course really interesting, but for me, what has been really, really important, what has really drawn a, a, a good amount of resources from my lab into the field is that uh, mental illnesses the, the major ones pri are primarily manifested during this stage. So the slide that I have is, is, is an example of, of, of which I'm sure Dave Lewis mentioned this, uh, but the relevance to schizophrenia. This is a, a diagram I took from a really nice uh, review uh, that just came out a, a year ago, uh, plotting clinical symptoms of schizophrenia as a function of stages of illness. And as you can see, adolescence is obviously where all things start happening. Uh, the field of schizophrenia, and again, I'm using schizophrenia as an example here, has actually gotten in the past uh, three to five years quite good at detecting individuals that are, that are at very high risk to develop schizophrenia. But the question is, okay, we have these people that we have identified that are at, at 20 to even up to 40% of developing schizophrenia. What are we going to do to intervene to prevent transition? We have no idea. And the thing is, ethically, there are a lot of things that, that, that we have to deal with because obviously we cannot take these kids and give them hardcore antipsychotics. In fact, some people have and they don't work. So we really need to know what to do in illnesses like this. I think we are obligated to really focus a lot mechanistically on what we need to do. How can we intervene now that we can identify this population? Well, we really don't know how to intervene because we really don't know exactly what happens in the brain. The clinical field, most of you guys have done an outstanding job in identifying general pathways, a fair amount of dynamic shifts in what happens during this stage. But we need to get more to the nitty gritty of receptors and pathways and, and signal transduction systems, very much the work that Susan talked about, to be able to really go to the next step, which is how can we intervene. So, we have heard a fair amount about the things that happen in the adolescent brain. What my lab has been interested in is how do all these changes that we have seen at the level of, of, of the human imaging studies, as well as at the level of some of the animal studies that the Susan reviewed, how do these changes influence behavior? In particular, we decided to start with motivated behavior because motivated behavior, of course, is at the gist of it all. Like it's really not only in the context of normal vulnerabilities, but in the context of illness, it's very much the motivated behavior that you could argue is, 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 is affected, okay? That's a mouthful. How do you go about studying motivated behavior? Well, one of the things that you can do in, in, in animals, and one of the things that we do in our lab is actually record from a bunch of regions, for a bunch of cells. So the data that I'm going to focus on today is very, that, that data set, so we were, uh, I believe we were the first lab who started actually recording from adolescent animals while they were behaving. So what we do, we can have these animals do 
various tasks, whatever tasks we want them to, implant uh, arrays of electrodes in different regions, allow them to recover. Now with adolescents, you don't have the adolescent rodents, you essentially have about 10 days to do the entire experiment. So it took about a year and a half to, to two years in the lab to really adjust things to be able to record from adolescents. And then what we get is uh, cell activity, and some of the data I'm going to show you would be heat plots like this, where um, as uh, cells are firing faster, the colors are getting warmer, and as cells getting, are getting um, firing slower, the colors are getting cooler. This is a typical example of about 45 cells from six adolescent animals getting a saline injection. Uh, not much is happening. It, a few cells here and there react. Another thing that we can actually measure in these animals, and we do, uh, and I will not, for the sake of time, will not talk about it, is local field potential oscillations, which is highly relevant to human fMRI, EEG, and MEG studies. And we are in the position now to collect large-scale data from different regions and start really begin to understand how different regions interact at the level of phase locking of single neurons to these larger scale oscillations that human studies can actually measure. So the behavior that we first uh, concentrate on, and that's the only behavior that I will talk about today because of the shortage of time, is a simple Q-mediated learning. So it's a very uh, simple behavior that's at the gist of almost all go uh, goal-directed behaviors. So essentially, animals are, sh are exposed to a cue. After they hear the cue, they need to do an instrumental act. In this case, they poke. And once they poke in the nose poke hole, they get a reward. So essentially, a light comes on, the animal nose pokes, and then a food pellet is dropped. So we record continuously during initial learning, maintenance, and also extinction from this task. And we can look at changes during in response to all these salient events. So what, which one of these events, cue, instrumental action, or reward, would you have thought that would have the biggest difference in adolescents versus adults? Okay. I can tell you, we don't have any volunteers. I can tell you, if, you were, if I was teaching you, I will be taking five points off your next exam because nobody's volunteered. But I can tell you, my prediction, having raised teenagers with Q, they don't, like, they don't get the Q. They don't hear it. They must not be, you know, it just must be having something to do with Q processing. Well, the one variable, which at least in prefrontal cortical regions, we have never seen ever, ever any difference in processing is the Q. So they're getting that Q. Um, so, what we, the region we started with was the orbitofrontal cortex. So I'm going to show you data in response to all those three events, Q, instrumental action, and reward in the prefrontal cortex. And this is approximate area in the humans, and this is essentially where we were recording in, in the rat adolescents. Um, and of course, orbitofrontal cortex was, is really interesting in the context of especially uh, psychiatric illnesses like, like schizophrenia because it's really well situated to integrate sensory and emotional information. It influences value expectation, and it's also very strongly implicated in decision making and cognitive flexibility. Okay, so because I'm going through a lot of data really quickly, I'm going to condition your mind and give you the actual summary of what we find and then quickly go over the data. So what do we find in orbitofrontal cortex? We find that in general, adolescents have less neuronal inhibition, meaning that in response to a given salient, uh, salient event, there's far less inhibitory responses, and, but they selectively have a higher response to the actual reward. We also find that the spiking is more variable. Um, so there, there are different ways of, in, 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 in if, you, if you're recording from a whole bunch of spikes like we are, there are different ways of analyzing how stable or how variable these spikes are. And it's, that's a really interesting phenomenon, and there's a fair amount of debate in what it means, but it generally, the less variable the spikes are. Now, this is, uh, this is independent of whether you're seeing excitation or inhibition, but the less variable the spikes are, it's thought that the signal is being processed far more efficiently. So this higher variability in spikes could potentially provide a mechanism for less efficient processing in adolescent brain. So let's look at the data. This is adolescent units, adult units, baseline period, Q starts here. As you can see, not much difference in response to Q. Uh, here is just a Z-score, which is average of all these. 
And this is, uh, let's not worry about this. This is um, in inhibitory excitatory responses. Let's go to instrumental pork. Again, not much of a difference, but then differences start to emerge when the animals go for toward the reward. So as you can see, there's a profound in excitatory response in adolescents during the period of reward expectation and also when they consume the reward. Whereas in um, prefrontal cortex of, of adults, you see the expected actually a down inhibitory response to reward. We also, with different ways of looking at spike variability, we just consistently see that spiking is, is more variable. This is um, an example here that I'm showing is, is called FANO factor, and it's essentially it's a way of uh, look, uh, normalizing the variability by dividing cross-trial variance by, by cross-trial mean, and throughout the recording period, independent of what's going on, if you just look at the pattern of spikes in the prefrontal cortex of adolescents, they show more variability. So going back to our summary of prefrontal cortex, less neural inhibition, more activation to reward, spiking is more variable. This essentially suggests that reduced adolescent neural, there's, there's reduced, um, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex of adolescents are processing the same behavior in a less efficient way. Now remember, they're doing the, the, these two group, age groups are doing the exact same difference, same behavior, so we're seeing very diff we're seeing differences in, in, in processing despite the same behavior. So cortex was interesting, but then we got far, far more interesting results when we moved on to basal ganglia. Uh, we started recording from nucleus accumbens and dorsal striatum, and these are roughly the, the regions that we were recording, although our electrodes were more the me more medial part of the dorsal striatum. And of course, we were interested in basal ganglia for a variety of reasons. They receive uh, emotional, sensory, and cognitive information. And of course, they are the major input for the dopamine system. And we were especially interested in nucleus accumbens because, of course, it's quite critical for reward processing. And to be honest, I encouraged the uh, um, graduate student, was MD, PhD student, David Sturman, who was doing these studies to put electrodes in the dorsal striatum as a control because we figured nothing's going to happen in the dorsal striatum. Dorsal striatum is a region that, you know, um, is very much involved in action selection, habit formation, but we were looking at learning, associating cue with a reward. So we were really going to code that we're going to see these amazing differences in nucleus accumbens. Okay. So the summary of what we found, no differences in nucleus accumbens. Uh, essentially a response to cue, instrumental response, and I'll show you the data, and also a response to reward, identical almost in adolescents and adults. On the other hand, <clears throat> we saw that dorsal striatum has a starkly different response to uh, reward in adolescents. And let me just show you the data quickly. Here's nucleus accumbens, uh, response to cue, instrumental nose poke, and uh, anticipating reward and receiving reward. This is the uh, z-score, which is the summation. As you can see, no difference. There was no significant difference here. When we go to dorsal striatum, not much of a response to Q. Again, dorsal striatum is not a region that's Q responsive. Then the differences start to emerge when during the instrumental response. And then what we were really surprised to see was that there was a huge excitatory response during the reward anticipation in the dorsal striatum of adolescents. In adults, which is uh, summarized in blue here, this is a very classic dorsal striatal response to reward, which is an inhibitory response. Um, but this was, this was really unexpected, and it's quite a large response to, to Q. And essentially, what this could suggest is that a region that is very much involved in action selection, habit formation, reward has straight immediate access to those neurons. Generally, in a regular brain, you have to activate the limbic system, nucleus accumbens, and there are these parallel pathways between nucleus accumbens, and then you get feedback to those little striatal regions that are involved in habit formation and action selection. Here, you may not need to go through all these steps and several connections and several pathways. Immediately, this region that's very much involved in selecting your next action is getting profoundly excited by anticipating a reward. So again, the summary. Uh, so what this indicates is that the dorsal striatum, which again is critically involved in learning and habit formation, is highly responsive to reward in adolescence. And it could potentially provide 
for a mechanism for why reward anticipation might shape adolescent behavior differently. And, and I think it's, it's the sort of, uh, um, I, I, we don't have time to, to, this audience really doesn't need the explanation for why this is important, but I think it was very cool that this, this was, uh, uh, this, is, this is the data, although it was entirely um, against what we expected. I almost feel like funny and fake submitting adolescent grants because I know whatever hypothesis working things I have, it's going to be wrong because every time I've predicted anything, it has been wrong. So this is not, <laughs> Definitely not predict that dorsal starting would be a reward reactive region. Okay. Finally, the dopamine system. And um, I don't have time to go into the dopamine recordings we've had. The data isn't published and is in, uh, is, was actually just recently submitted. But I, I'm going to show you some release studies. That's the work of Margaret Matthews, who's uh, present uh, uh, in the audience. And this is looking at. Uh, essentially uh, how the dopamine system reacts under basal condition in uh, with awake animals that are during their awake cycle in, in the home cage environment and how they respond to uh, amphetamine. And again, what we find was really interesting in that, again, we saw that um, the dorsal striatum was hyperactive, whereas nucleus accumbens was not that different. So this is the data. And lo looking at this is with microdialysis, measuring dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and dorsal striatum. Animals are given vehicle or amphetamine. Amphetamine, uh, blue is, again, adults, orange is adolescents. Amphetamine does the same, has the same effect on uh, nucleus accumbens in both age groups, whereas endosal striatum profoundly smaller or reduced effect in, the, uh, in uh, adolescents. And I, I looked at this and I thought, this is really strange. I mean, I've been working with amphetamine for a long time. Amphetamine is amphetamine. Amphetamine is just, should just release dopamine. Um, so this data pr prompted uh, Marguerite to go and do more analysis with the tissue to see what are, what are, what are some of the proteins that are involved in mediating amphetamine. Um, and what, what we find, what, what she found was that um, there is actually um, a really interesting difference between TH activity. So tyrosine hydroxylase is the enzyme that is critical, the very limiting step for synthesizing dopamine. And amphetamine releases newly synthesized dopamine. So if TH is less active, you actually, you're going to have less dopamine that can be re readily released, that's available to be released. So even though we found changes in dopamine transporter in between adults and adolescents, which actually had been reported before, we found that selectively in the dorsal striatum, there is a reduction in TH activity, meaning that there is less dopamine that's available to be released on demand. So uh, to summarize what I have showed you, neural processing of reward is dramatically different, not Q, but reward anticipation in the prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia. And the dopamine system is different in unexpected ways. We're still investigating this. But so far, what we have seen is that, at least in the case that the animals are challenged, that there is a very selective effect in the dorsal striatum. Okay, how am I doing for time? Good, awesome. So, let me then end by why I think this is important. So I think this sort of research is really has important implications for research, especially clinical research, because it could help investigators to focus on regions such as the dorsal striatum that are really are not traditionally associated with affective processing. If you do drug abuse research, if you do depression research, probably the last region you really want to emphasize on is sub-regions of association striatum and dorsal striatum. Uh, but these are the regions that are actually not only ending up different in our studies, but in large number of, um, and actually it is large now, uh, studies coming out in, in schizophrenia in the prodromal uh, 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 stage that show that this association, associative striatum, dorsal striatum, it, it's, seems to be hardly uh, different in uh, individuals who are high, high risk to, to develop schizophrenia. It also, I think, has implications for treatment and intervention. For one thing, if our data really implies that dopamine system could be hypoactive, not hyperactive, the last thing you want to do is go and give uh, adolescents an antipsychotic drug. Because it's not going, maybe they're neuroleptic, so maybe it like numbs them for a little bit, but certainly is not going to get to the pathology if, in fact, 
at that stage, we don't have hyperactivity. We may have hyperactivity. So we really need to be thinking out of the box. And I'm going to end with one example of how far out of the box it is. And my, my, one of the main goals is that if this pneumonia doesn't kill me and the next, next incidents don't kill me, that I, I will die um, having shown to, to my colleagues that alternative medicine is not alternative medicine. It should be real medicine because um, nutrition is a, a huge environmental factor and brain is a metabolic machine. Whatever you eat, not just calories, whatever you eat in terms of essential amino acids, fatty acids, first and foremost are influencing on a very dynamic, and I would argue an immediate way, the function of your neurons. And the example that I have here for you is that, um, remember I showed you this slide um, about how can we intervene to prevent illness pro progression. One of the most effective ways that so far the field is reporting for prevention is taking these individuals that have been identified to be at very high risk and giving them omega-3 supplements. Uh, this is the study that came out in the archives of general psychiatry. Um, and this group has reproduced it. There are a number of other trials that are going on. And it was this, the data has been quite amazing. And if you actually, if I bring your attention here, that after 12 months, only two out of 41 individuals that were giving the supplements had converted to full blown psychosis, whereas only 11 out of 40 had, so the, the usual 20 to 30 percent had uh, converted. And this particular cohort, two years later, none of these, um, none of these uh, remaining uh, 39 had converted. Um, so one of the things we have been doing based on this and other studies is to actually have animal colonies, animal models of omega-3 deficiencies. Uh, because what has happened in the society, in the Western societies, is that since the 60s and 70s, am I done? Just one more slide. Uh, there's been this reduction in omega-3 deficiencies. So what we have, and the, this, this paper is actually at, um, electronically at now, so I invite you to check it out. But just one thing that we have found in our omega-3 deficiencies that adolescents are highly, highly more receptive to this deficiency and the region that we find that's highly affected more than any other region is, again, the dorsal striatum, and that there is enhanced TH activity in adolescents and reduced in the adults. So let me uh, end by showing you the name of the present and past lab members who have contributed to this research. The brave souls who are doing adolescent works are bolded, and I thank them. And if you want to see how good-looking they are, please go to the lab website. There are nice pictures of all of them there. Thank you very much.